I'm going to start off with a quote from Oscar Wilde's The Soul of Man Under Socialism, uh, which I normally do every Sunday. Um, Wilde writes, Know thyself was written over the portal of the antique world, over the portal of the new world, be thyself shall be written. And he wrote this in 1891. Um, and I think Wilde was onto something. I do, I do think we live in a culture in which the idea of authenticity, uh, the idea that individuals should be true to their own unique way of being themselves, as the uh, philosopher Charles Taylor uh, defines it, I think that idea holds sway today. Uh, I think the idea of authenticity today almost has an unprecedented moral force. Uh, it's almost like a moral imperative. Uh, it says one ought to be oneself. And it says something else too. It says that others ought to recognise... Um, it, it says that others ought to recognise mine and others' authentic ways of being. One ought to respect others' attempts to be themselves. Uh, one ought to affirm others' unique ways of being. So the idea of authenticity, I think, goes hand in hand with what Frank Ferreira uh, pointed to as the politics of recognition. Uh, in fact, Charles Taylor, of course, uh, solicits the idea of authenticity as the precondition for the politics of recognition. Um, and I think the idea of authenticity underwrites identity politics. I think it underwrites the idea that one is truly oneself, say, as a, as a gay man or a, or a woman or an indigenous person, uh, and that others ought to respect and recognise these uh, unique ways, well, largely unique, unique ways in which people are being themselves. Uh, and I think it underwrites and drives uh, the contemporary proliferation of identities. Uh, indeed, the very idea, if you like, of trans identity, which uh, people keep returning to, I think, over the course of this weekend, uh, the very idea of trans identity, which I think is almost like the culmination of the politics of identity. Um, just think of, the, just think of the, the kind of cultural prominence given to trans identities. And I don't think this would make sense uh, if the imperative of authenticity wasn't so highly valued. Uh, the logic, or think of the logic of trans identification, which runs as follows. Uh, it, it begins with an individual not identifying with the identity ascribed to him by society, as a man, say, or a woman, uh, and all the behavioural expectations uh, that those labels carry with them. Uh, the trans individual does not feel that he or she is being true to his or herself uh, in the form of that label. And such is the growing preeminence of the moral imperative to be oneself that it is increasingly acceptable, perhaps even encouraged, for that individual to assert a chosen identity, uh, to uh, manifest, if you like, one's true self. And crucially, Others, institutions within society, employers, fellow citizens and so on, uh, they are morally obliged to recognise the authentic self of the, uh, of, say, the trans individual, the individual asserting themselves, their authentic being. Um, I do have a lighter example of the moral imperative to be true to oneself, which I think is reality TV, which itself I think is a manifestation of the culture of authenticity. Uh, because the worst thing you can be... In, uh, in, in, in the context of reality TV, the most reprehensible thing you can be accused of in the context of reality TV, uh, it's not being manipulative, it's not being rude, it's not being particularly unpleasant. Uh, no, the worst thing you can be accused of is being fake. Oh, you're so fake, that's the worst thing you, be, you can be accused of. Oh, you're not being real. That is the worst thing you can be on reality TV, of being two-faced and so on, of not being yourself. Uh, it's virtuous to be yourself. It even sort of legitimises being incredibly rude uh, to people in the context of reality TV because you are being yourself. Oh, I always, always speak my mind. Uh, I, I think you're boring. You know, that's, a, that's an incredibly virtuous, <laughs> virtuous thing to do because you're being yourself. Now, what I want to do here is sketch the development and um, the emergence of this culture of authenticity. And I say sketch uh, because I realised as I was writing this that uh, it's very sketchy. Uh, and I want to show how the imperative to be true to oneself, to be true to one's unique way of being, um, uh, leads selfhood, if you like, into a cul-de-sac. That is the ethic and the idea of authenticity, uh, far from promising a radical individualism, uh, as some of its more excited kind of proponents in the 1960s thought it would, far from encouraging, if you like, uh, autonomous individuals to experiment in the world, uh, to, to pursue particular uh, projects and so on, to pursue particular ends because they are freely deciding to do so. No, the, the idea of authentic, authenticity actually leaves the individual at once perpetually needily dependent on others for recognition affirmation, uh, which only an external agency wouldn't force. 
And it also, I think, leaves the individual isolated, estranged, at odds with the social world, almost like forever circling uh, the emptiness of a self defined not by what someone becomes in the world, uh, not, by a kind of, not by a social identity which one might acquire, uh, not by projects recognised, uh, 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 recognised, admired and disliked and so on, not by the sensuous practical activity uh, of, of, of the thesis on Feuerbach. No, the authentic self, uh, and I know Josie touched on this yesterday, is defined almost entirely in opposition to engagement in the world, in opposition to society, to the, more importantly to the mainstream. Uh, its content is not developed through engagement in the world, it is developed in antagonism with the world. Uh, it, pits, uh, it, it pits against the world, either a reified essence, you know, a spin-off of my nature, uh, my sexuality, my ethnicity, or so on, or it is even more explicitly negative. Uh, it, I am not this social label, I am not that social label, and so on. Um, now, I'm going to start off by looking at the emergence of the idea of authenticity during the Enlightenment, uh, which, uh, actually, we always seem to tend to return to uh, at the Academy. Um, it strikes me that the, de the development of the idea of authenticity, uh, I think, is inseparable from the development of the idea of autonomy. Uh, I think it's actually sort of entwined around the roots of the idea of autonomy. Um, because like autonomy, the idea of authenticity emerges in the context of modernity, um, of the Enlightenment, of course, in particular. It emerges as the promise of individual freedom, a freedom from the repressive structures and forms of authority of traditional and feudal society. Uh, and it emerges as a freedom to pursue one's own idea of the good. And I'm going to argue that the idea of authenticity diverges from the idea of autonomy at the point at which it betrays a disillusionment, a, dis a, a discontent with the emerging modern world and the rationale and reason upon uh, which that world is based. Uh, I then want to quickly trace, very quickly, trace its development uh, uh, in Romanticism in particular. I want to look at how the idea of authenticity un underpins, if you like, both the idealisation of art uh, and a, as an expression, if you like, of, a, of an individual's authentic nature, and the idealisation of the artist as a creative genius, as an original. Uh, I, I'd probably say that the Romantic art, artist is almost, at, at points, almost the paradigm of an authentic individual. Um, I then want to suggest that authenticity becomes a cultural critique of the modern world, and it does this throughout the 19th century, um, particularly during the 1920s and 30s. Uh, I will then look quickly at the point at which the authentic, inauthentic split gains its explicit formulation in what we know as existentialism, before concluding, uh, as, as, some, uh, as some of the other lecturers I should probably have, in the 60s uh, and, 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 the, and the 70s, which I think is the point at which the culture of authenticity is effectively mainstreamed in the counterculture and in the new left. That is to say, the idea of authenticity, which had once been an expression of discontent with modernity uh, and had then hardened into an opposition to the modern world, becomes almost the organising ethic of contemporary society. Um, the, a cultural critique of modernity becomes the prevailing ethos of modernity. It's a, it's a very strange, almost paradoxical moment. So, the, idea of, the emergence of the idea of authenticity... Um, I think it's generated, like auto autonomy itself, by the forces of modernity, by that social energy, if you like, that melts all that is solid into air. Uh, we think of the, you know, the key moments, we think of the Renaissance, we think of the Reformation, we think of the increase in the economic mediation rather than feudal, political, face-to-face -face mediation, of social relations, i.e. the emergence of capitalism. And all this kind of stuff, it all starts to free up the individual. It all starts to individualise uh, the individual in various ways. It frees him, say, from the medieval chain of being. It frees him from religious authority. It frees him from uh, a traditional feudal social structure in which everyone, in a strong sense, knows their place, has their identity assigned to them. Lords and ladies, noblemen, servants, peasants, serfs, and so on. Those fixed identities start to melt into, in, into air. You know, the question of identity actually becomes a question at this point. Uh, the great disembedding, as Karl Pogliani calls it, uh, and that freeing up of the individual, of our capacity to question, to reason and to know for ourselves, even to ask for the first time, who am I, is the matrix for the Enlightenment. And it's in that work of that most kind of dazzlingly uh, paradoxical of thinkers, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, who Angus spoke about yesterday, uh, that an idea of authenticity starts to emerge. It's there in Mon uh, Montesquieu's Persian Letters, but I think it's Rousseau who really gives it, uh, really gives it a, sort of a, a, a kick up the backside. And it does so, I think, in conjunction with the idea of human autonomy, of our individual and collective potential to be self-governing. 
Uh, and I do think we have to keep remembering this point, that, that autonomy, moral autonomy and authenticity at this point are inextricably related. That is the freedom to reason for, uh, for oneself, the freedom to determine the law by which one lives, the freedom to exercise one's own moral judgment is entwined, although it's not identical with, is entwined with the freedom to be true to oneself, to express one's essence. Uh, and both ideas at work in, in, in Rousseau. So in the discourse on the origin of inequality, which is, written, uh, which is published in 1754, Rousseau provides us with a strong sense of humanity's potential for autonomy. He writes, Nature commands every animal and beasts obey. Uh, man feels the same impetus, but he knows that he's free to go along or to resist. And it is above all in the awareness of this freedom that the spirituality of his soul is made manifest. In other words, if like, man is free from natural compulsion, he is separated from it by his inner world, his, his burgeoning self-consciousness. And it is in this kind of consciousness of being free to act, to will a particular action, Rousseau is saying, that his humanity lies, what separates him from the, uh, from the beasts. And again, in the social contract, Rousseau was keen to draw attention to man's capacity for self-governance. Uh, So he writes, that was, that was not actually a pause laden with any particular meaning. I was just collecting, <laughs> collecting my thoughts. He writes of individuals that um, as, soon as, uh, as soon as he reached the age of reason, since he alone is the judge of the proper means of taking care of himself, he thereby becomes his own master. Um, and he's also keen to point out that it's only because social development has reached such a point uh, at which individuals can exercise a degree of freedom. Um, you know, so he's very keen to emphasise that uh, individual autonomy is dependent on a certain, uh, certain level of social development. You know, it's often, Bruce is often seen as someone who's very critical of modern society, but he also writes in praise of it. Um, so he writes, his faculties are exercised and developed, his ideas are broadened, his feelings are ennobled. This is in the state of society. His entire soul is elevated to such a height that he ought constantly to bless the happy moment that pulled him away from the state of nature forever, and which transformed him from a stupid, limited animal into an intelligent being and a man. You know, that's not, a, that's not particularly in praise of the, uh, of the noble savage there. But Rousseau also does something else. He emphasises self-government according to uh, uh, the, law of, uh, the laws of one's own reason, of course. He do, he's doing all that. But he also starts to emphasise uh, being governed by the laws of, of something else. And this is key. He emphasises instead being governed by the laws of one's own heart. The laws of one's own nature too, and you access it through through your feelings, through your sense of your of your heart. And he also writes. So he writes. So he also writes in uh, Emile, uh, "Let man see with his eyes and feel with his heart." Um, and this, you know, this is a this is a, an, an important shift um, because if you think about it, in, in 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 the case of moral autonomy, in the exercising of one's reason, if you like, one is partaking of the universal. You know, all men are born free. All men are born free. Indeed, one is asserting one's universality by exercising a kind of universal capacity to, to reason. Uh, you know, Kant will talk about rational beings. Uh, he will talk, um, Kant will talk about moral laws being universalizable, which is a, a terrible word, and I think I've added an extra syllable there, because other people are like us too. They, are, they, are, they like us are rational beings. Uh, so for Rousseau, man's individuality, self-development self does partially lie in his moral autonomy, in his development of his moral autonomy. But for Rousseau, it also lies in what makes him unique. Uh, uh, his heart, his feelings. Uh, so in feeling with your heart and feeling with one's heart, uh, one is inserting, uh, asserting one's sort of irreducible particularity, one's uniqueness. Uh, so as he writes in his Confessions, our sensitivity of heart allows us, to truly, uh, allows us truly to enjoy our being as the work of nature. It allows us to know one's true self. And Rousseau's problem the very reason he's writing an autobiography is that others do not recognise his true self. You know, Rousseau's always annoyed that others are, are mistaking him for something else. They're mistaking him for the roles he various plays. They're mistaking him for at points a Catholic, at points a Protestant. They're mistaking him for someone who serves in the military. They're mistaking him for someone who might be a, a pacifist. Um, they're always mistaken. They're always mis misrecognising Rousseau's true essence. At one point, he's angry or annoyed that people tend to think he's dim-witted, that he's slow-witted. He's saying, I I'm not. It's just in, in public, I'm dim-witted and slow-witted. <laughs> Behind the scenes, I'm lightning quick. He kind of proved it. But... <laughs> now, this is an interesting tension, I think, between autonomy and authenticity, uh, because it doesn't take much 
uh, for the accent on reason as the ground for one's moral autonomy, the ground for one to become a free, self-governing individual, to shift away uh, from reason, uh, to shift instead to one's heart, to one's feelings. And in doing so, feelings, one's heart, becomes the ground, I think, for what will later become one's, uh, one's authenticity. Now, I think the key to grasping uh, the subsequent development of the idea of authenticity, the point at which the accent shifts entirely from developing one's reason uh, over to uh, being true to one's self, being true to one's authentic self, is not to look so much at the idea of authenticity itself, but to look rather at the growing sense of the inauthenticity of the social world, uh, the growing sense that it is an impediment uh, to freedom, uh, to autonomy rather than its realisation. And this is a sense that grows as the, and this is a, you know, a, a terrible generalisation, it grows as the ruling class in society uh, proves increasingly capable of authorising and legitimising the social system over which it rules. So in Rousseau, uh, writing in uh, uh, mid 18th century, in, in a France sort of creaking under an absolute monarchy, there is, unlike earlier Enlightenment philosophers, a palpable disillusionment with modernity, a sense that modern society, while it might promise to free man, is everywhere enchaining him. So Rousseau writes of a, of a society in which many labour and in doing so enslave themselves to others, of law and the right to property empowering the rich, and above all, certainly for the purposes of this lecture, um, he writes of the development of the uh, he writes of, of, of the development of the idea of inauthenticity. He writes of the way in which the individual loses himself, is alienated from himself, loses his very capacity for autonomy. As Rousseau writes in the Discourse on Inequality, the social man knows only how to live outside himself in the judgment of others. Indeed, it is only from the judgment of others that he gains consciousness of his very existence. And this will prove a remarkably kind of uh, presci uh, prescient and resonant formulation. Rousseau is saying that in society man is living outside himself. He's not living according to his own judgment. He's living according to the judgment of others. He's not thinking for himself. And more importantly, he's only aware of himself as others see him, as others are labelling him, as others are judging him. He only sees and understands himself in terms of what others think of him. Now, Rousseau could, as Kant wants to do, uh, make a stronger case for moral autonomy. Uh, he's, always, he's already started to make that case. He could argue that the freedom to use one's reason publicly, in dialogue and argument with others, is to become autonomous in society. But, but he doesn't do that. Um, he's, you know, he's too discontented. Uh, his sense of the corrupting nature of social being, of its tendency to sort of misrecognise, to misidentify our true selves, its propensity, its propensity to uh, alienate oneself from oneself, is, is just too strong. And as a result, he pushes this idea of the law of the heart instead of the law of reason. He pushes the law of the heart as something to be cultivated, but to be cultivated apart from society, in solitude. You know, it's the cliche, preferably in, uh, you know, preferably in striking surroundings, perhaps the Alps, usually while walking. And it's in this contradiction between self and society, between this uh, uh, need to preserve uh, the authentic self and the threat of the inauthentic social mode, which is going to crush this authentic self, and the tentative solution he offers, the freedom to be true to oneself, to allow oneself to be guided, uh, not by the laws of reason, but the laws of one's heart, is in this that Rousseau can be seen to be making such a huge contribution to what we uh, understand and, 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 and view now as romanticism, but also to this idea of authenticity. Uh, and it is, it, it's marked just how influential Rousseau's ideas are, or better still, how resonant these ideas are. They really touch a cultural nerve. Uh, they play upon a sense, I think, prevalent among Europe's intellectuals and artists at the time, of the estranged, estranging nature of modern society uh, and the reason and rationale upon which this uh, society is based. Um, and it's often expressed in this way. You know, there's this dawning sense of spiritual homelessness. Uh, this, uh, you know, this is a trope of romanticism, particularly German romanticism. Uh, but it's also in English romanticism as well. You know, uh, Wordsworth writes of the lonely rooms amid the din of towns and cities. And, it's, oh, and, and the only thing that kind of preserves his sense of himself is to recollect his experience of nature while looking down on Tintin Abbey. Um, there is a sense that in, uh, in, in modern society that the individual loses himself now. There's a sense that he loses his individuality in society. That modernity, while promising individual autonomy, in fact depletes it. 
And so the appeal, the appeal uh, during Romanticism, the appeal is made, the moral appeal is made to nature, to one's nature, not to the things of nature as such. You know, it's always a cliche that romantics are kind of chatting up trees and frolicking in the foliage, but they're not. The appeal is made to one's experience of nature, to the feelings it stimulates. The appeal is made to one's heart, which will kind of resonate uh, uh, in the experience of one's natural surroundings, because that is the truth of oneself. Uh, as, Rousseau, uh, as Rousseau and the Romantics tend to see it. Um, that's the truth of oneself, and, it, and it's grounded, they ground it on nature. That is to be the source of one's selfhood. And you can see this, you can see this sort of, um, this working itself out in, um, uh, in Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Werther, which is uh, published in 1774. Um, and this plays precisely on this contradiction between reason and society in one's heart. So, through his letters to uh, his friend, and, you know, my God, Werther writes incredible letters. Uh, he barely lets his friend respond. In fact, his friend doesn't respond. It's just endless letters. He's on, endlessly expressing himself. And through his letters, we become aware of uh, Werther's attempt to find himself at home in the world. Uh, you know, at points he likes these kind of secluded rural spots, you know, which you know, are populated by simple rural folk. You know, that's always a kind of, uh, again, another kind of trope of romanticism. Um, but due to his kind of love, due to the, uh, due to the kind of stirrings of his heart for the married Lotta, um, the things, and it, again, the yearnings of his heart, it's, it's important to draw attention to how important the heart is in the Souls of the you know, At one point he says, the things I know, every man can know. You know note the, universally, uh, the universality there of rational knowledge. But, oh, my heart is mine alone. And because of this commitment to his heart, because of this, this commitment to Lotta, because of his love for Lotta, which will have to break societal conventions, because she's married, uh, Werther is drawn into a conflict with the social world, the conventions and reasons upon which it is based. So he rails against the, re uh, the this is, uh, these are Goethe's words, uh, the rules and regulations of middle class society, which ruin our appreciation of nature and our powers to express it, which effectively ruin our appreciation of our own nature and our ability to express ourselves. Uh, he, attack he attacks the levelling down of social existence, it's crushing of individuality, it's cultivation of conformism rather than individuality. Um, he writes, I find it intolerable, even in our daily life, to hear it said of almost everyone who manages to do something that is free, noble and unexpected. Oh, he's a drunkard, he's a fool. I don't know why I'm doing this voice, actually. He's a drunkard, <laughs> he's a fool. They should be ashamed of themselves, all these sober, all these sober, sober people and the wise ones. Um, and of course, what Goethe, this noble, this noble, unexpected genius gesture is, is of course, uh, the suicide. That, 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 that's what he's angry. That, that's what he's angry about not being recognised. And so it goes on. And so powerful and compelling are tr are, and true is Goethe's heart. So compelling is the, the, the laws of uh, sorry, Goethe's heart uh, in this conflict with conventions and regulations of society that he's almost compelled to commit to the abyss, uh, to commit suicide. Uh, his death, if you like, is almost like a triumph of his authentic self, of him being true to himself. So I, I think Rousseau and Romanticism in general are key to the development of an idea of what it is to be true to oneself. Uh, this, uh, you know, th this conception of an idea of listening to one's heart, of being true to one's own individual nature, uh, and they do so in opposition to the modern world, uh, dominated, say, by the cash nexus, you know, governed by the, 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 the mammon of exchange and you know, crude Philistine business interests and so on. Um, now, it, it, of course, it's important to remember that, you know, as it happens, the French Revolution, certainly the Romantics, promises to solve the disillusionment with things as they are. It promises to get rid, and these are, uh, are, these are words, worth words, it promises to get rid of the meagre, stale, forbidding ways of custom law and statute, as, uh, as Wordsworth put it in the French Revolution. And... It would allow reason to assert her rights in the very world, which is the world of all of us, the place where, in the end, we will reside, and so on. Now, of course, the turn of the French Revolution, the terroristic turn of the French Revolution, and the emergence of a kind of uh, you know, Napoleonic uh, France prompts again disillusionment. Um, but this is, this is interesting in the development of Romanticism, um, because it both deepens the sense of the inauthenticity of the world and the moral value of the idea of authenticity. And I think one of the innovations at this point is the transformation of art and culture more generally into a domain of authenticity, a domain in which people can be themselves, can express themselves, can express their true selves in ways denied by the operations, conventions uh, and activity, if you like, uh, of the social world. 
Uh, you know, in fact, Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy, uh, which is late, uh, written, I think, in the late, 60, in, in the late 1860s, um, you know, it's infused by romantic sensibility. Uh, it directly counterposes art and culture uh, to the business interests, he uses the phrase business interests, uh, and, philist and philistinism uh, at work, uh, up in operation in the workaday world. Um, so he writes, of course, that it's through art that one cultivates one's true self. Of course, that's because that's where you're being real to yourself. That's where you're being true to yourself in the domain of art. And, that, and through, kind of, through culture, one is able to pour a stream of fresh thought on stock notions and habits. Um, and it's so, in fact, it's during the Romantic moment that the idea of art and the idea of the artist changes as well. The work itself is no longer an addition. The work of art is no longer an addition to an, ex you know, to an existing uh, tradition. It's no longer a copy of what has gone before. Uh, it is now, to be new. It's now always to be new. It's always to be uh, unique. It's always to be original. Uh, and likewise, the artist changes the role of the artist. The artist is no longer a craftsman. He's no longer working according to perhaps accepted techniques. Uh, you know, he's no longer striving to be, uh, say, an epic poet, uh, as, as perhaps uh, Milton was aspiring to be in the tradition of epic poetry. Um, and he's no longer perhaps representing uh, some religious meaning which is kind of figured or allegorised uh, in the world. No, the, the, the artist now is to become a creative genius uh, who, th who threw reference only almost to himself uh, which for the Romantics was to call upon one's nature, not to some external source of sacred meaning, uh, only through himself, <coughs> sorry, almost using his own resources to conjure up um, uh, and express something authentic. Um, and in actual fact, uh, the, the 18th century German thinker, uh, Johann Gottfried Herder, will turn this idea of an authentic essence expressing itself into the model for different cultures in general, in, in the model, if you like, for a group authenticity. Uh, you know, that an, the idea is that a, a people has an authentic essence which is expressed, if you like, in their, in their communal culture. An idea that will inform, I think, um, the, uh, the idea of group expression, group authenticity in something like the uh, domain of multiculturalism. Now, over the course of the 19th century, you can see the way in which with every sort of, kind of reactionary turn in, in political affairs, with every kind of deepening of, 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 of what is it almost, it's not really articulated as such, but experiences the crisis of, 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 of bourgeois ideology, of, of, of bourgeois society, be it the revolutions of 1848, in which a kind of new class antagonism really start to impinge itself on public consciousness. Uh, you can see with each of these kind of moments, the domain of artistic expression becomes increasingly valorised as a site of authentic being, because society is experienced and seen as being increasingly inauthentic. So you can think of the intense aestheticism of someone like Sir Gustav Flaubert writing in the 1850s, where, where art is counterposed to the life of the kind of the imbecilic bourgeoisie. You can think also of the kind of the, uh, the Nietzschean reaction to uh, what he sort of perceives as the kind of the uh, self-deceiving nihilism of, of, of the modern world. You know, his answer is to make oneself a work of art, almost to, just to embrace the fact that you are an individual uh, who has nothing on which to ground one's sense of truth but oneself. Um, uh, and again, you can see it in the kind of the, the art for art's sake fetishism of the kind of the, the decadent moment in sort of English culture, beginning with someone like uh, uh, Walter Pater, uh, including, you know, including the decadent poets, you know, these kind of little men who kind of cavorted with prostitutes and fell off stools drunk, uh, people like Oscar Wilde with whom we opened this lecture. Uh, you can, again, you can think of the impressionism of the, uh, of the visual arts, which privileges the kind of subjective vision, the subjective experience of the world as the truth. Um, and this, I think, is always because society is always being seen, increasingly seen, as a site of inauthentic being, uh, a place where the individual loses his or himself, loses his inauthenticity. Um, and on and on this kind of development goes. And I think, you know, it, it, it's at its most explosive, I think, in the 1920s and 30s, a period of kind of high modernism, um, where, you know... Artists are not even representing external reality anymore. They're searching for the truth within. You think of uh, To the Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf, which is a, an excavation of one's inner self. She's not appealing to nature in the same way that romantics did. You know, th there's a new ground for the authentic self now. Now it's one's uh, uh, consciousness, subconsciousness. That's what she's exploring there. And it's interesting that the culmination of To the Lighthouse, right at the end, uh, one of the key protagonists, uh, young Lily Briscoe, she realises herself, she becomes authentic because she completes her painting. That's what she does. That's the culmination of To the Lighthouse. The exciting denouement of To the Lighthouse. Lily Briscoe finishes her painting.
Now, this bit, I'm going to say this is the weakest part of the lecture, but who, who knows, it's not for me to judge. Uh, but, it, but it's in existentialism, from Kierkegaard to Heidegger, uh, I think, that, uh, and later Sartre and de Beauvoir, uh, that the idea of authenticity and inauthenticity gains its most explicit uh, formulation. It's, it's there that it's kind of named as such. Uh, and again, it is a movement informed in the first instance, I think, by an increasingly intense disillusionment with the trajectory of the modern world. It's also informed by disillusionment with, the, with what is seen as the failure of the Enlightenment project. You know, Kierkegaard is writing in response to, uh, in response to Kant, but also to, to Hegel. He's, you know, he's fed up with Hegel trying to make spirit at home in the world. You know, he's trying to say, actually, uh, people are not at home in the world. The world is it's a bit rubbish, it's spiritless, it's meaningless. We are not at home in the world. You know, th- he opposes what's seen as sort of Hegel's, uh, what Adorno would call this reconciliation, this false reconciliation with the world. Um, so take Soren Kierkegaard's The Sickness Unto Death, which is published in 1849. He asks and answers the question, what is the self, which is incredibly important for, the, for this year's academy. Because he's going to answer, he's going to tell you what the self is. The self, this is, you've got to listen to this. The self is a relation which relates to itself, or that in the relation which is relating to itself. Now that's clear as mud. Um, <laughs> thank you, Soren. What he's actually trying to say, I think, is something a bit like this. Uh, that firstly, a human being is a, synth- is a synthesis, a kind of active relation between freedom and necessity of, uh, of infinity and finitude, which you know is, is, is about right. It is about right. You know, we, we are free, but we're always battling against kind of external uh, constraints. Um, and that, he says that's the kind of nature of our active being. But then he says something else. Uh, the human being becomes a self, he says, he argues, when it takes this active being, this kind of, this, uh, this synthesis of kind of being free but feeling constrained, when it takes this being in the world, if you like, as its own object, as something to be concerned, when it starts to relate to that relating, when it starts to reflect upon its, it takes itself as its own object. Um, and this, I think, will anticipate the next thinker uh, I'll, I'll quickly talk about in a second, which is Martin Heidegger, who, who likewise can define human being, or, well, it's Martin Heidegger, so it doesn't have the name human being, it's Dasein, being there, something like that, uh, as the being for whom being is an issue. The individual who takes his... In, uh, and I'm kind of pushing this interpretation onto Heidegger because, uh, as I say, he refuses to use uh, everyday language, or if he uses everyday language, he uses it in, in, in a particularly esoteric fashion. Um, the ish, uh, the, the uh, individual, uh, the, the authentic individual, uh, no, that's wrong. The individual is someone who takes his existence, is capable of taking his existence as something to be concerned about, to reflect on. Uh, as Heidegger put it, uh, Dasein is the being for whom being is an issue. Now, Kierkegaard, of course, being a Christian, or, being, or trying to be a Christian, I think that's a better way of thinking, does something else. Uh, the self, this being who relates to its own being, um, is related um, to that which established it, which established this relating to the relating, which is God, right? Uh, but the problem is that God has disappeared. Now, this is always, this is always a massive problem for much of the 19th century. There's, there's talk about God, but it's mainly about God's absence. It's God forsakenness, which is kind of the motivating uh, factor here. Um, so the problem is that God has disappeared. Uh, God has, uh, has let go of the self. He's let go of this self that is um, able to reflect upon itself. Um, so the self, Kierkegaard says, is in despair. Or at least it ought to be if it was actually aware that God had gone anywhere. Uh, if he was actually aware of his God forsakenness. And that's the problem, because he's not. And why? Because the self has lost itself. It has lost itself to the social world, uh, which it has lost itself and emasculate itself. And uh, Kierkegaard uses the, uses the word authentic. It's lost itself to the inauthentic um, social world. So, and th- th- now this is a startling passage by Kierkegaard. He writes, um, he writes of uh, the self losing itself in the social world. By seeing the multitude of people around it, by being busied with all sorts of worldly affairs, by being wise to the ways of the world, such a person forgets himself in a divine sense, forgets his own name, dares not believe in himself, finds himself too risky, finds it much easier and safer to be like others, to become a copy. That's interesting, a copy, which is obviously the opposite of an, of an authentic original, to become a copy, uh, to become a number along with the crowd.
Now, Kierkegaard, of course, will argue that it's good to be in despair, right? It's good to be aware of one's despair, to aware that God's gone somewhere. It's almost like, in fact, talking about being fed up with oneself. You know, Kierkegaard gives it a kind of particularly kind of theori- uh, theological kind of spin. Um, because being in despair is a step closer to choosing oneself, to choosing to be one's authentic self, and to, to be, it's a, clo- a step closer to choosing to be true to oneself, which is the self before God, which is choosing faith. Um, He writes, becoming conscious of one's despair is a step nearer, a dialectical step nearer being cured than all those who are not regarded, who do not regard themselves as being in despair. And that's because they're the copies, they're the comfortable, they're the dopes. Uh, Kierkegaard's self, I think, is grounded here. So, as I said, is ground on being true to one's own nature, which is created by God. Now, being in despair, as far as Kierkegaard's concerned, opens up the possibility of choosing uh, to be faithful, of choosing to believe. Uh, and this, of course, is the leap of faith. This is the awareness of God's absence taken to be the awareness of his existence. This is the moment of the radical decision where you're aware of that's where, that which is missing and leaping for it. This is the leap of faith. Now, Martin Heidegger, who um, I was going to say is everyone's favourite thinker, but he seems to be no one's favourite thinker. Martin Heidegger, who really makes a thing of authenticity in, in, authentic, in authenticity in being in time, which is uh, published in 1927, it really is the, is the only book you perhaps need to read of Martin Heidegger. I say read, struggle through. He offers a brilliant portrait of what it is to be, of what it is to exist in the world, uh, of how we come to know the world, of how we come uh, to know ourselves. Um, but like Kierkegaard, he says that actually that's a, it's a problem. Um, we have lost ourselves in our kind of commonsensical way of understanding ourselves. We have lost ourselves in the world of social existence. We've lost ourselves in the being in the world with others. Uh, Heidegger says that effectively, that in being with others, we exist on others' terms. You know, this is, this is so redolent of, uh, of Rousseau here. Uh, in being in the world with others, we exist on others' terms. We exist as part of what he calls the they, uh, which is something like the social mass, which is mass society. Now, the German for the they is das man, which allows um, Heidegger to do something really interesting, because das man is the pronoun one. So Heidegger is effectively writing that in being in the world with others, in one's social existence, it is not a case of I think, or I ought, or I am. Uh, it is a question of one thinks, one ought, one is. It's an existence that, if you like, is governed by the norms, mores, and opinions of the mass, represented, of course, by this impersonal pronoun. Now, how long have I got, Angus? Well, Right. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I'm, I can fill it with dead air now, aren't I? Really sorry about that. Yeah. I would almost just want to skip over the bit, you know, the, the bit about Heidegger, kind of the way in which he. Yeah, skip, Jesus, yeah. <laughs> well, basically, you know, Heidegger, uh, he wants to say that he draws a t- particular attention to this idea of angst, of anxiety, right? Which is, uh, he says, this is being anxious. What is it to be anxious? Right? Uh, it is to be. Um, it's not to be sort of anxious about something in particular. It's not to be sort of scared of something approaching, you know, a, a really sort of feral dog or something like that. Um, it is to be, um, it is to be concerned. It's the dawning awareness of being concerned with one's own existence, with the awareness that uh, one is responsible for oneself. Effectively, that's what that's what he's kind of saying. Um, and he'll then relate that to being aware of one's finitude, of being aware that one will die, that one's life is not infinite, that you can't go on postponing, doing anything, or taking responsibility for your life forever. I'm giving a very kind of commonsensical interpretation uh, of, of Heidegger here, but, but, but I think that's, that's, it's the best way to, to think of it. So Heidegger in a kind of really uh, dumbed down way, is almost saying, you know, you've got to live each day uh, as if it's your last. But he, of course, it's Heidegger, and everyone, what does everyone know about Heidegger? He's a, he's a Nazi. Um, <laughs> So, while he suggests, while he makes a case for being uh, true to oneself, while he uh, makes a case for the cultivation of one's authenticity, one's authentic nature, he will then, of course, ground that authentic nature. As everyone's doing, he grounds his authentic nature in, in effectively blood and soil, the blood and soil of the, of the Volk, 
Uh, so to be authentic is, is to take responsibility, also not for oneself, to be, but to be, take responsibility for one's uh, kind of, uh, for, for one's, you know, the, the destiny of one's community. I'll talk about destiny a lot and so on. So you can see right away how Heidegger might start to you know, find, some, find himself quite at home in the Nazi movement. Now, having finished that rather kind of whistle-stop tour of the idea of what it is to be true to oneself and how uh, that is informed by the sense of the social world's inauthenticity, its oppression of our individuality and our willing acceptance of its oppression, of its suppression, uh, our willing acceptance of losing ourselves, our contentment in having lost ourselves. That whistle-stop tour is actually just a prelude for the, the, uh, for the conclusion of this lecture. Uh, and the point at which the idea, I think, of being true to yourself, the idea of authenticity, becomes a political cause. The, the point at which the, uh, the idea of authenticity becomes politicised. The point at which, if effectively, being true to oneself becomes a political, uh, a political cause, something to be pursued. And that point is the, is the 1960s and, 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 and perhaps the greatest in the 1970s. Uh, and why... Uh, because, and this is incredibly crude, and I know there are people in this audience who will be able to explain this perhaps uh, in, 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 in a far more kind of uh, cogent and uh, illuminating fashion. Uh, I think because thanks to the baby boom on the one hand, there was this kind of huge cohort of young people coming of age, uh, entering adult at the same, at the same time. Uh, now that in itself doesn't, you know, doesn't mean too much. It needn't generate the huge cultural shift which I'm talking about here. But I think what's key is that they're entering the adult world at a point in history when that adult world, the social world, is no longer ideologically justifying itself. It's no longer felt to be legitimate. It's no longer felt uh, uh, that it's providing a meaning for itself and for those who work within it. Uh, it's not it, it, almost directionless. You know, you have... You, uh, you know, the, the creeds of liberal capitalism you know, have suffered quite a buffeting over the previous 20, 30 years. Um, so yes, of course, this is an affluent society. Everyone talks about it, looks at the paradox of affluence. You know, people can be rich, what, we, what they're complaining about. Uh, but for those coming of age in it, those expected to identify with this society which is the coming of age, it lacks a kind of meaning. Uh, Theodore Rozak, a theorist, a theorist effectively of the counterculture, writes that uh, in the late 60s, the adults have almost given up on the adult world. And what I would argue is that the cultural critique of modernity, which I've kind of been tracing and hinting at, this cultural rejection of society as inauthentic, which has been building and accreting, if you like, for decades, is almost mainstreamed at this point. Uh, the crisis, which is effectively a crisis of a cultural uh, elite, uh, and it, of course, becomes this kind of cultural critique, uh, it, becomes almost, it becomes the crisis of society. Uh, and you can think, you think of the key texts of the 1960s. You know, think it, it, it's... It, Existentialism is, is key. You know, uh, some of that Camus, the outsider, is kind of like a miniature Bible for kind of the, the just post adolescent. Uh, there's the, also the dawning of a particular version of Kafka, where kind of individual man is pursued by, a, by a, you know, an oppressive totalitarian bureaucracy. Um, you know, think of the key intellectuals. Think of someone like Herbert Marcuse. Uh, he's, he's always associated with uh, the Frankfurt School and is seen as being kind of a quasi-Marxist. But of course, he's a he's a student of of, of Martin Heidegger. Um, but he's seen as the voice of the counterculture, or we certainly uh, push forward as such. Uh, think of the kind of the, the popular sentiments, the rebel without a cause. Think of the kind of the slightly pre-60s moment of the beatniks, the, uh, the 60s moment of the hipsters and so on. You know, think of the version of Freud that emerges at this point, where civilization and its discontents, which I think when it was written is almost like a tragic vision of the conflict between society and an individual's nature. Uh, you know, obviously sort of uh, portrayed in uh, psychological terms, uh, it ceases to be a tragic vision and just becomes like a manifesto for pansexual liberation. Um, think of the ideas of getting in touch with one's true self, of personal, rela uh, of personal liberation, of the personal is political. Uh, and think of the new left. Um, and there's this fascinating book by Marshall Berman, who, who, who wrote a fabulous book about modernity, All the Solids Melts Into the Air. Um, and this book is, in, is from 1970. It's called The Politics of Authenticity. And he writes, the moral basis of the new left's political critique was an ideal of authenticity. Uh, this outlook was new and yet old, radical yet traditional. Thus, the new left's lasting cultural achievement, one that may outlive the new left itself, has been to bring about a return of the repressed. This is key, to bring radicalism back to its romantic roots. To bring radicalism back to Rousseau, to where we start this lecture. And I think what's vital to grasp is that the complaint that society uh, represses one's true self, that it hides one's true self, that people have lost themselves 
in, in, in society uh, is transformed. It's transformed from something a cultural elite does in almost like solitary communion with nature or leaping into faith or, pre- or in the preserves and domain of, uh, of high culture into the demand that society recognises one's true self. The society stops being inauthentic and almost becomes like a receptacle for the channeling of authenticity. The demand that social existence becomes a space in which people can be themselves, can express their authentic being. And this is key, that that true self will be recognised, respected and esteemed. So this is the birth of the politics of recognition. And it's, it's, so the politics of recognition merges at the point at which the culture of authenticity becomes mainstreamed. It's also the point at which the idea of autonomy is eclipsed, because what emerges during this moment is a cast, and Frank's talked about this in fact, a cast of enablers from the uh, kind of therapeutic class who, get, who uh, allow people to get in touch with their true selves, to get in touch with their feelings. The legal experts who give kind of legal sanction and protection for authentic, usually group uh, uh, authentic ways in which groups are, are themselves. And the numerous activists who kind of feeding on the culture of authenticity make a case for their own unique identities, their own unique group identities, uh, make a case for those to be recognised uh, for, for those to be recognised and given legal protection. We deserve recognition and protection too, they're saying. Um, and I think as a final note and a lead into Claire's session in fact, it's worth understanding the character type which is fostered uh, by the idea of authenticity as a moral imperative. And that character is one who demands that the world is a mirror of his or her sense of authentic being. Um, a character who constantly sees in others uh, a tendency to misrecognise them, uh, to not mirror back to them their true, th- their true selves. Uh, and it therefore asks uh, external agents to enforce that recognition. In other words, what starts to emerge, I think, is the figure of the narcissist. I think the culture of authenticity generates the figure of the narcissist. And the narcissist, while they might be self-obsessed, they're not self-determining because the narcissist does not develop his independence. He's thoroughly dependent on a cast of enablers to constantly and perpetually affirm his authenticity. And there I end.